we're going to jump right into the message. So we started a, um, a series a couple of weeks ago titled Home for Christmas, Home for Christmas. And uh, I'm going to have you turn to two places in your Bibles this morning. Turn to Matthew chapter 2. We're going to begin there in just one moment. And then put a bookmark in 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Matthew 2. Matthew is the first book of the New Testament. And then if you keep going back towards the end of your Bible, uh, you're going to eventually run into 2 Corinthians chapter 9. 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Just put a bookmark. If you've got a paper Bible with a ribbon, put the ribbon in 2 Corinthians 9. Put a bookmark, your program, something to just... You know, just leave it in place there. If you've gone to Revelation, the last book of the Bible, you've gone too far. So make a left-hand turn and go back a little bit further. Uh, if you're using a smart device, then click on Matthew chapter 2 uh, as we begin reading there here in just a second. All of the scriptures are going to be up on the screen uh, behind me. You could jot down the reference, study them throughout the week. That will be wonderful. Uh, but we began this series a couple of weeks ago. And the big idea of this series is that the beautiful thing about the gospel, the good news of Jesus, is that no matter where you are or where your current state is, Jesus welcomes us home. And the first week uh, we learned, the first week, the title of that message was The Light. And we learned that Christmas is not about what's happening around us. Christmas is about what happened. And we learned during that message that God is not afraid of the dark. And we celebrated many people coming home to Jesus, coming home for Christmas at each service. I think it's, it's you know, that's worth just one more time just saying thank you, Lord, for the many people, even in this service, that said yes to Jesus. And then last week, uh, we shared a message called The Table. The table that that we're, we're seeing here a progression as it comes to this journey with God. That this journey with God doesn't end when you come to the front porch to the light. But God opens up this wide big door and invites you to come in. And when you do, there is a table waiting for you. And at that table, you can find rest, you can be restored, and you can find fellowship with God. And so I want to take us a little bit further from that table, that dining room table, and I want us to take a trip into the living room. And there we will find not just a tree, but we will find the gift. And so the title of today's message is The Gift. And so in Matthew chapter 2, beginning with verse 10, we're just going to read two verses. It says that when they saw the star, they were filled with joy. They entered the house and saw the child with his mother, Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasure chest and gave him gifts of gold, frankincense, and of myrrh. These wise men who had traveled a very long journey, the Bible just uses the phrase from the east, uh, parts of maybe India or maybe even further, they came to... Uh, Bethlehem via Jerusalem, and as they approached this family, and as they found this family, and the Bible says as they found the baby laying in the manger, that they didn't come empty-handed, but they brought to Jesus gifts. The Bible mentions three specific gifts. Now, I don't know if you know this, but um, if I were to ask you how many wise men there were, the typical answer we would get back is three. Now, the Bible doesn't tell us how many wise men there were. We assume that there were three because there were three gifts that were mentioned specifically. Historians tell us that there were probably upwards of maybe even 14 wise men. We don't know. But if you're comfortable with the three, I don't want to mess up your nativity scene in your front yard or, you know, wherever you have it set up. Three is fine. You're okay. There may have been more gifts, but... The three that were really highlighted were the gold, the frankincense, and the myrrh. Now, we're not going to stay very long on the significance of these gifts, only to mention that these gifts were very practical. They were very practical. I mean, uh, I could have used some gold when my first child was born, but I, I don't remember receiving gold. But Mary and Joseph got gold. 
gold was very practical. They, they could use it uh, for to buy a home or to, to to do whatever they needed to do. Frankincense was very practical. Those of you that are that are really into essential oils, you know, frankincense is both. Uh, they call it the jack of all trades. Um, it's also the not tonight essential oil, honey. It's it's some of you you have no idea. But if your spouse wears that oil, it pretty much says not tonight because it, it has just a different smell to it. Um, I, I know nothing about that, by the way. I'm not speaking of. Um, but it's, it's very practical. It was used for medicinal purposes, for all kind of all reasons. And then you have myrrh as well. And not only were, were these gifts, uh, uh, were they um, practical, but they were also prophetic. The gold speaks to the kingship of Jesus. As they brought this gift and presented the gold, they were declaring that who is born today is not just a baby, but the king of the Jews. He was a king. And the gold, that gift, was prophetic in that. The frankincense uh, was prophetic in, in the frankincense speaks of the priesthood of Jesus. That Jesus was a priest. Frankincense was one of uh, the things that were used in, in incense and in the offerings and the sacrifices. And then the myrrh was very prophetic in that the myrrh was what was used to embalm a dead body. It spoke to the death of Jesus that he would die for the sins of the whole world. And so these gifts were very practical and they were very prophetic. But the story began when that star that they saw that night began to attract them and turn them and move them in the direction of where the Savior was. That one star out of the billions that were in the sky, God chose that one star and he lit it up especially bright so that it would get the attention of these kings. And then from India to Jerusalem, and then from Jerusalem to Bethlehem, that star was so bright because of its close proximity to the sun, it gave direction to the seekers and the searchers. It was like a travel guide that God would use to get them to the Savior. In their mind, they probably were thinking, I'm so glad that God put that star in our path. I'm so glad that, that God chose to give us a sign and, and it didn't just light the way for one night or for two nights, but we followed that star from the moment that we first saw it when God lit it up in the sky and it kept leading us like a tour guide for nights and nights and nights and days and weeks until we finally were able to get to the Savior. And they were so thankful. And I thought about how none of us that are here are here by accident. I thought about how none of us ever arrive to the Savior somehow by just wandering on our own and accidentally running into the Savior of the world. I thought about how God used somebody because of their close proximity to the Son, Jesus, and some person got so close to the sun that their life began to shine and it began to get our attention. I thought about how in the moments of my life when I was lost, how God used a person, a star if you will, as a travel guide to get me to the Savior. I think about how many in this room and how many watching, whether it's online or on television, how you have come to the Savior and you did not get there on your own, but God used a star in your life that shines so brightly, that grabbed your attention and turned you and moved you in the direction of the Savior. They weren't the Savior, but they were the one that God used to point to the Savior. And it was because of that life and that man or that woman that's 
star that shines so brightly that you found yourself at the feet of a Savior who was gracious and merciful and forgiving and gave you life and gave you a fresh start. That person may be in heaven this morning, but God used them. I thought about the stars that God used in our family. I thought about the stars like Hector and Pastors Hector and Ruth Vega. These were stars that were shining brightly in a little Hispanic church in Midtown Manhattan. And because they were shining many years ago, my alcoholic father and my mother who was getting ready to leave my dad saw those stars and those stars pointing them to a savior. I thought about how whenever my parents met Jesus and growing up all of my life, I thought about my dad who was a star in my life. How every now and then I would just barge into their bedroom unannounced and I would find my father kneeling at the side of his bed, praying for his children, praying for his wife. And he was shining brightly while he knelt by that bed as a star that would lead me eventually to the Savior. I thought about Pastor Cruz and Elizabeth Goyaso, which were the pastors of my early upbringing. And how God used them as stars to see many come to the Savior. And I would not be here today if God had not used these stars as travel guides to lead me to Jesus. I thought about my father-in-law, George, and the stars that shone brightly at General Motors that led him to the Savior. And then he began to shine brightly, and that brought his family and his children to the Savior. And I thought about how maybe in your life, God put some shiny, bright lights that led us to the Savior. And I think we ought to take a moment and thank God for the shiny lights that he used to lead us to the Savior. Come on, let's thank God for them. They may be in heaven this morning. They may be sitting next to you. They may be in another state, but we thank God for them. Not only do we thank God for them, but God wants us to be bright stars for someone else. You can be a bright light for your family. In fact, in Philippians chapter 2, it says, it gives us an admonishment. It says, do everything without complaining or arguing. Translation, have a good attitude. Be likable. <laughs> Why? So that you may be blameless and pure children of God without fault in the crooked and depraved generation in which you shine like stars in the universe. God is saying, I want you to be so approachable, so likable, so close to the sun, Jesus, that you shine like bright stars in a dark world. Not so that people can applaud you and say how wonderful you are, but so that you can lead others to the Savior that set you free, that forgave you, and that who brought everlasting life into your darkness. When they got to the star, the Bible says that it led them to a stable. They did not expect the star to lead them to the stable. What they were expecting was the star who was leading them to not just a king, but to the king of kings. They were expecting that star to lead them to this majestic palace. One that they had never seen before. And yet the star would not lead them to a palace. It would lead them to a stable. And sometimes in life, we are led to stables of life, and the question is, what do you do? What do you do when you thought this would happen, but you find yourself not in a palace, but you find yourself in a stable, in a stable at your job, in a stable in that relationship, in a stable in your singleness, in your stable at 30 or at 40 or at 50. I did not expect it to lead me here, but you find yourself in a stable. You do what these wise men did. You begin to look for God in the stable. Because listen to me, God is not just a God in the palace, but God is in the stable. You find Jesus in the stable. It is in the stables of life that you look for God because standing in the shadows of your mess, there you will find Jesus. Somebody give him praise for just a moment that he's not afraid of our darkness. They offered their best worship to him. They gave their best worship in unpleasant circumstances. It's like the, the wife and the daughter who 
last Sunday in the lobby after second service approached my wife and I simply to tell me, the wife, that I lost my husband two days ago. The daughter, I lost my dad two days ago. And they were here in that horrible, dark circumstance, bringing their worship and their best to God. I was able to be a part of that funeral service this past Friday. And the lines and lines and lines of people, the service was supposed to start at 7. It didn't start till 8.30. And how God was present in that room. Why? Because somebody was willing to worship and find God in the darkness of the stable and in the shadow of that dark moment, they found Jesus, and Jesus was glorified and lifted high. Go ahead and give them thanks for just a moment. You know, you don't learn, you don't learn to give your best praise and worship on the good days, on the sunny days, on the days when everything is going great. You learn to give the best praise and worship in unpleasant circumstances because the praise that costs the most counts the most. Praise that God looks for is not when you're in the palace, but when you're in the stable. And so what they did is they brought gifts to Jesus. They brought gifts to Jesus, gold, frankincense, and myrrh, both very practical and very prophetic. Very practical and very prophetic. And when you take this journey with God, one of the things that you learn is that when you come to the tree... You find many, many good gifts. Some of you are like Ralphie from the Christmas story, and you want that official Red Rider Carbon Action 200 shot range model air rifle. But God does a lot better than that. One of the things you find in God is gifts. You find the gift of forgiveness, the gift of mercy, the gift of grace, the gift of hope, the gift of freedom. When you take this journey with God and you find yourself being drawn by the light who is Jesus and you open up that wide door and you have a seat at the table and after fellowshipping and spending time and resting and God restoring you. He draws you into the living room of the kingdom and he sits you down and he says, I've got gifts for you, Juan. I've got gifts for you, Josh. I've got gifts for you, Susan. My kingdom and my tree is loaded with gifts and and many of them have your name on it. And many of us who have been on this journey with God can attest to it that when we came to God, God who is so generous, we were met with not condemnation. We weren't met, met with a belt or a switch or a stick, but we were met with by a God who was generous and kind and lavished us with gifts of forgiveness and deliverance and freedom and healing and salvation and hope and purpose because that's who our God is. And I think it's very appropriate for us to celebrate him because God is good and God is generous. Go ahead and thank him for just a moment. But, but the, more, the more you go at this and the longer you're, you spend time with God, here's what you recognize. You recognize that all of those gifts are wonderful. The gift of eternal life. The gift of, you know, when I look back, the gift of a mom and dad that stayed married for 52 years. And they, they raised us in a good home. And, and all of those things are wonderful. But if you at this long enough and if you spend enough time sitting there at the tree and spend enough time with Jesus, here's what you find, that ultimately, Jesus is God's gift. Jesus is God's gift. That that more than what he can do for you, it is who he is that is the gift. That Jesus is God's gift. In fact, in John chapter 3, verse 16, many of you know it. I mean, you could quote it with me and not even have to put it up on the screen. Where it says that God so loved the world that what did he do? He gave his only son. And see, we, we think that the giving of gifts was introduced by a third century uh, saint named Nicholas. Right, who historians say that there was a poor family and something happened and he ended up putting gifts of, of gold in, in stockings by a fireplace and we get the story of Christmas and, and we just mess it up as a Western culture, you know. But he was a real person, he was uh, he was a priest and all of that, and he he was somebody but we think that it started there and it doesn't. Gift giving during this season goes way back. 
We find it in that first Christmas in Bethlehem that, that there, there was an exchange of not just wise men bringing gifts to Jesus, but also God, God giving a gift to the world wrapped in flesh, born as a baby in a manger, the gift of Jesus. God is so generous. God is so generous. And so with, with the, the, the message title, The Gift, I began this journey this week to try to, you know, if Jesus is the gift, how do you describe this gift? Let's talk about the gift. And that was my journey as I began just studying for this message and, and thinking about what we were going to say today. And, and I began trying to, to just find, okay, how, how do we describe the gift? How do we describe what we receive in Jesus? And man, I am just looking. I am studying. I'm in God's word. I'm on, the, I'm on my, 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 app, my app, my software uh, thing for that, you know, the study Bible thing. I'm Googling. I'm asking Rabbi Google, you know, all these questions. And I'm trying to figure. And, and then all of a sudden, I run into this verse in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 15. I ask you to bookmark it, but here's what it says. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. And that was it. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. And I realized I cannot describe it to you because his gift, Jesus, is indescribable. And the Apostle Paul, when he wrote this, it's interesting that in this letter he's speaking about generosity. And he's talking about giving of ourselves and, and giving of, of offerings and, and of things. And he's talking about, you know, uh, the church in Macedonia, how they not only gave gifts, you know, they weren't only tithes and kingdom builders, but they gave of themselves. And, and then he ends all of that letter and he talks about God, thanks be to God. And he introduces us to a word that you don't find anywhere else in the New Testament and you don't even find in the Old Testament, the Hebrew, uh, the, he, the, the Greek translation of the Hebrew text. You find it nowhere. It's a word that is trans, transcendent. It's a word that is beyond. He, and it's a word that, 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 that is just grand and big and is full of wonder and is full of grandeur. Thanks be to God for this indescribable gift in Jesus. When you look at the totality of history, both biblical and natural, creation was phenomenal, but it wasn't indescribable. The destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah was frightening, but it wasn't indescribable. Abraham, the father of faith, his willingness to lay his son on an altar and raise a knife above him to plunge it into his chest, that's remarkable, but it wasn't indescribable. Moses leading the exodus as the Hebrews left the bondage of Egypt. Oh, fantastic. But it wasn't indescribable. The crossing of the Red Sea on dry ground was magnificent, but it wasn't indescribable. The building of the tabernacle in the wilderness was amazing, but it wasn't indescribable. The cloud by day, the fire by night that led the children of Israel through that wilderness. Absolutely astonishing, but it wasn't indescribable. The construction of the temple under Solomon's rule, very impressive, but not indescribable. David's killing of Goliath, amazing, but it's not indescribable. The prophecies of Daniel, mind-boggling, but they're not indescribable. Even the preservation of Holy Scripture, astonishing, but not indescribable. But when you come to the gift that God gave in Jesus, you don't have the words, not even Paul, the apostle Paul, who had written a third of the New Testament, had the vocabulary to describe the wonder and the grandeur and the amazing gift of Jesus, he would call it, it's indescribable. It's indescribable. 
The fully and the, fo- the foolishness and the folly of man to think that somehow I can get up here and with the use of simple words describe to you a savior that not only do you recognize you need, but you would ultimately want. I can't do it. I am limited. I am limited not only in words but in perspective. I am limited to describe to you this wonderful gift called Jesus to the point where you would say, I will receive that gift. Because that's what you ultimately do with gifts, right? You don't work for gifts. That's why a gift is called a gift. It's, first of all, it's, it's free. If you receive gifts and it's not free... We have to have a conversation. Gifts are free. And the way you receive a gift is by receiving a gift. And Jesus is God's gift. And yet this gift, not only does Paul say, but I concur, is indescribable. And so what do you do with something that's indescribable? What do you do if, 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 if you and I, we find ourselves out in the lobby or over coffee or at lunch and we're having a conversation and I am just trying to somehow, some way describe to you what it was like to be somewhere or take this trip somewhere or, or met this person. And if I, if, I can't, if I can't describe it to you with words, what's, what's the natural thing that follows? Oh, you just... You just have to come and see for yourself, right? In other words, you you, you just have to experience for yourself. Well, when I tell you about going to Israel and, you know, maybe you've never been, but it's on your bucket list. We've been like a dozen times and, you know, and we're trying to explain to you what it's like to get off that plane and step on to that ground there in Tel Aviv and recognize and realize that you are on the land that God says is his, his name is written there and you take you to Galilee and we go up on the Sea of Galilee, and we get to get on a boat like Jesus and his disciple did, and when we place our hand in the water, that water still has the molecules, the DNA of when Jesus walked on the water, and, and Peter fishing on that water, the miracles that happen when we do all that, and then we travel south to Jerusalem, and we walk on steps that Jesus walked on when he went to the temple, and we do all of that. It's hard to describe. It, you have to come for yourself and experience it. The same is true with Jesus. You must experience the gift. You must experience the gift. And now more than ever, we need, and I emphasize that word need, we need desperately an experience, not just an explanation. Explanations are important. We want to make sure that we explain things properly, but we don't just need an explanation. We need an experience with Jesus. I remember being out of the country up in the Balkan Mountains, and the community that we were in was a completely Muslim community. The people were Muslim, the officials were Muslim, the policemen were Muslim, the mayor was Muslim. But there was this family, this was whenever I traveled to Bulgaria a few years ago, and we were up on the Balkan Mountains. But there was this family that opened up their home for me and another missionary to come and just, and just share the story of Jesus. And I remember sitting there, and I remember explaining Jesus, and explaining the gospel, and explaining what Jesus did. And I remember that they stared and, you know, I did a good job in explaining. But there wasn't really anyone in the room that was rushing to know the Savior just based off of my explanation. So I look over at the missionary and I said, hey, can we pray for these people? Can we ask if anyone needs prayer for any reason? He said, absolutely. And so we began to do that. And one of the persons that needed prayer was the mayor, this Muslim mayor. And through the translator, he told us about his back and how he had very, very back, uh, bad back pain. And, he, and, and it was hard for him. And, and, and he wanted prayer of healing for his back. 
And so I told the translator, I said, can you ask the mayor if I can place my hand on his back? I don't know what the translator said, but the man got on the floor and said, yeah, you can massage my back. I'm like, listen, this ain't that kind of party. I, I didn't say all that. I just, I just wanted to softly lay my hands on you and pray for you. And so we got it all figured out. And we prayed for this Muslim mayor, and within three minutes, through the translator, where's your pain level? It started off at like an eight or a nine, and then it went down to like a three and a two, and then we prayed again until ultimately he had zero pain, and he was jumping up and down, and you began to see this joy hit his face, because why? He wasn't just given explanation, but he experienced Jesus for himself, and before it was all said and done, not only that mayor, but that family, and some of the community people that were there, they began praying this prayer and receiving the gift of Jesus. Why? Because you need not just an explanation, but we need to desperately experience the one. And listen, listen, the world is crying out. The world is crying out. This generation is crying out. Don't just tell me, show me. Don't just tell me that God loves me. Show me God loves me. Don't just tell me about a God who forgives. Show me forgiveness. Don't just tell me about a God who heals. Show me healing. And a generation is crying out, not just for an explanation. We've been doing that for hundreds of years. But the, the generation, the world is seeking for a church, for a man or a woman to show them an experience, an encounter with the only one that can forgive and heal and give them hope and set them free. It reminds me of a man in John chapter 9 who experienced Jesus. He experienced Jesus' healing power in his life. And then he was asked by the religious people, well, well, who is Jesus? Give us an explanation. Give us an explanation of who this Jesus is. And, and this man didn't know. He didn't have a good explanation. In one verse, he calls him a prophet. In another verse, he said, yeah, he might be a sinner. A prophet or a sinner? Which one is it? And he says in verse 25, he says, I don't know. I don't have a good explanation, but here's what I know. I once was blind, and now I see. I don't have an explanation, but I have an experience. And some of you here, listen to me. You don't need to go to Bible college or to cemetery or seminary or anything else for God to use you. You may not have a good explanation, but you have an experience. Let me tell you where Jesus found me. I was lost. Lost and now I'm found. I was blind and now I see. I was an alcoholic. Now I have been set free by the blood of the Lamb. I used to be broke, busted, and disgusted, but now I am highly favored. I'm the head and not the tail. I'm above and not beneath, and I can do all things through Jesus who gives me strength. Somebody give him praise for just a moment if that's your story. That's what Jesus has done. The gift. The gift. Sit down for just one more moment. We're going to end. I promise you we're going to end in just a few moments. I want to end with this story. A number of years ago, two Americans answered an invitation from the Russian Department of Education to teach morals and ethics based on biblical principles in the public schools in Russia. They were invited to teach in prisons and businesses, police and fire stations, and a large orphanage. About 100 boys and girls who had been abandoned and abused and left in the care of the government-run program were in that orphanage. The men relate the following true story. Here's what they said. Christmas time came. And we told the children about Mary and Joseph arriving at Bethlehem. They had heard none of that in their entire lives. We told them of their finding no room in the inn. The couple went to a stable where the baby Jesus was born and placed in a manger. Throughout the story, the children and the orphanage staff sat on the edge of their stools trying to grasp every word of this new story that they had never heard. 
Completing the story, we gave the children three small pieces of cardboard to make a crude manger. Each child was given a small piece of a small paper square cut from yellow napkins I had brought with me. No colored paper was available in the entire city. Following instructions, the children tore the papers into carefully laid strips and placed them in the manger for straw. Small squares of flannel cut from a worn out nightgown an American lady was throwing away as she left Russia were used for the baby's blanket. A doll-like baby was cut from the tan felt we had brought with us from the USA. The orphans were busily assembling this manger as I walked among them to see their work. All went well until I got to the table of one little guy named Misha. He sat staring at the manger he had made. He was about six years old and had finished his project. But I was startled to see not one, but two babies. Quickly, I called for the translator to ask the lady why there were two babies in the manger. And crossing his arms in front of him and looking at this completed manger scene, the child began to repeat every, the story very seriously, word by word. For such a young boy who had only heard the Christmas story once, that was remarkable. He related the happenings accurately until he came to the part where Mary put the baby Jesus in the manger. Then Misha started to ad-lib. He made up his own ending to the story. He said, and when Maria laid the baby in the manger... Jesus looked at me and asked me if I had a place to stay. I told him I have no mama, I had no papa, so I don't have a place to stay. Then Jesus told me I can stay with him. But I told him I couldn't because I didn't have a gift to give him like everybody else. But I wanted to stay with Jesus so much, so I thought about what I had that maybe I can use for a gift. I thought maybe if I kept him warm, that would be a good gift. So I asked Jesus, if I keep you warm, would that be a a, a gift good enough? And Jesus said, if you keep me warm, that would be the best gift anybody ever gave me. So I got into the manger. And Jesus looked at me and told me I could stay with him forever. As little Misha finished his story, his eyes brimmed with tears. Putting his hand over his face, his head dropped to the table and his shoulders shook as he sobbed and sobbed and sobbed. Let's stand to our feet. And as we do, I want to ask everyone to just shut their eyes for just a moment if you're able to. With no one looking around, I just simply want to give you a moment. I want to give you a moment and ask you to push beyond the familiar. Push beyond the familiarity of this. You know what this season to be. Even the story. The manger and the stable. And for just one moment, if we would allow ourselves to find ourselves in the story. Because remember, Christmas is not about what's happening around us. There are people here this morning that what's happening around them is they're grieving the loss of a husband or dad or child. For others, what's happening around them is they're celebrating the life of a child. They're celebrating the fact that that father or that mother has been given a clean bill to health. Some are celebrating a promotion. Others are wondering what they're going to do because they've been laid off. See, Christmas is not about what's happening around us. Christmas is about what happened. And no matter where you find yourself here this morning, Jesus is here. And you are here. And there is an invitation to come. Even if you have no gift to bring, you are the gift. 
if you can find yourself in this all too familiar story and in a fresh new way, not just go through the motions, but experience Jesus for yourself today and this Christmas season. I promise you, you will leave that encounter and you won't even be able to describe not just what he has done, but who he is to you in your darkest moments and in your best moments. And so before we leave here today, we're going to do what we do every week, and that is we're going to pray for people. And as we pray for people today, what we're believing is for every person, whether you might come to just thank God for something good he's done in your life, or maybe you'll be coming up for prayer because you can't deal with the grief or the pain or the sickness, the rejection or the trauma, whatever your need is, I promise you that today you will encounter Jesus, and when you do, You'll never be the same again. Everyone looking at me. If you're here and you're far from God and you don't want to be, before you leave here today, you join all the others that will be coming up for prayer. You tell somebody on our prayer team, I want to begin a relationship with Jesus. And today you can receive the gift of eternal life, the gift of forgiveness. You can receive the indescribable gift of Jesus if that's you. In fact, we're going to do that now in just a very quick second. I want our prayer team to come and get ready. Honey, I want you to join me as well. As our prayer team is coming and getting ready, my wife is coming as well. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to bless you. And then at the end of the blessing, if you're here and you need prayer for any reason, any reason at all, we want to pray for you. You don't have to be a member of Victory Church to receive prayer. But if you're a person and you need prayer, then this next moment is just for you. So keep your eyes open as we bless you. At the end of this blessing, you just slip out of your seat and you come and we'll pray for you. Friends and family of Victory Church, I bless you today. I bless you in this Christmas season for you to see with fresh eyes the wonder and the grandeur and the indescribable gift that God sent over 2,000 years ago for you and for me. And that as you find yourself in the story, that in the process you would experience him and encounter him and experience his forgiveness, his joy, his peace, his freedom, his hope. And your proximity to the sun may cause you to shine brightly in this dark world. Everywhere that you go, I bless you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.